We're delighted to have Jason Riley here. Uh, thank you, by the way, to our friends at Free to Choose Media for that great documentary released earlier this year on Thomas Sowell. Of course, Jason is the author of the book Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell, which is brand new, just came out a few days ago. And uh, so we're delighted that he could join us here at Resource Bank for a conversation about Thomas Sowell. Um, I should also mention that Jason will be signing books. We have a limited number, um, and he'll be in the foyer at 2.30 today, along with Dave Rubin, who's going to be signing his books. So uh, if you are interested and, um, and would like to do that, make sure that uh, you don't miss that opportunity at 2.30 during our networking break. So Jason, let's begin uh, with a conversation about um, the great Tom Sowell. Uh, you write in uh, the book, and you have heard you do other interviews, saying it was difficult to get him to let you write this biography to begin with. <laughs> Tell us about that story and how you were able to convince him that his story should be told. Well, one way I was able to convince him was to get uh, some of the people you saw in the video to go to bat for me, namely uh, the late Walter Williams, uh, who unfortunately is, is not with us anymore, but uh, Walter Williams and, and, and Shelby Steele and some others um, went to Tom and said, Tom, let Jason write this book. Someone's going to write this book. It might as well be Jason. And, and, and Tom had said to me, um, uh, I didn't need his cooperation to write it, to just go, go and write it. But I wanted to, to have his cooperation. I, I, I thought it would be a better book if he cooperated. And, and so I, you know, it was going to be 91 years old later this month, so maybe I just warmed down. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Why, why is it so important to tell his story? Make sure people know about his life. Oh, for, for, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that Tom has distinguished himself as, a, as an honest intellectual, uh, someone who is willing to follow the facts where they lead, even when they lead to unpopular or politically incorrect conclusions. And you might not think that's, that's such a big deal, but unfortunately it is in today's world where a lot of scholars uh, do not do what, what Tom does. They do not put... You know, truth above popularity. They are much more interested in warding off the social media mobs and so forth and uh, being popular than being truthful. And, and Tom is someone who, um, whose research is rooted in empiricism. And, and uh, he's a straight shooter. And, and we need more honest intellectuals like that. Uh, this, the second reason uh, I wanted to write the book is because I think it's tragic that uh, names like uh, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates or Ibram Kendi or Nicole Hannah-Jones are better known than Thomas Sowell. And uh, even though, you know, he, he, he has written circles around these individuals, maybe more than all of them put together. And uh, his, his research and his uh, scholarship is not only far more broad-based and wide-ranging than theirs, it's also much deeper and more rigorous than they are. Uh, uh, he, he anticipated many of their arguments decades ago and refuted them decades ago, uh, in some cases before these, 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 these folks were even born. And, and so uh, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book and, and do the documentary is to um, uh, introduce Tom uh, or make him better known to, uh, to, to people, particularly younger people. Well, that's fantastic. We appreciate you doing it. You have an excellent piece. Jason, of course, is uh, a, a columnist at the Wall Street Journal and has an excellent piece uh, recently um, in, that, in that publication there. Um, Jason, let's go back to something uh, from that documentary with, with his interview with Dave Rubin. Um, and, and early in his life, uh, he did uh, believe in Marxism. What was it about that philosophy that appealed to him early in his, uh, his, his life? Well, first, it's not unusual for a lot of people uh, who later become more conservative to have started out on the left. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan started out on the left. Milton Friedman started out on the left. Um, I'm sure uh, any number of scholars at conservative third, uh, think tanks were, were leftists in their youth. So, th so that's not uh, particularly unusual. It is interesting uh, uh, that a number of black conservatives, however, not only started out slightly left of center, but in, you know, in Tom's case, it was Marxist. Yeah. You know, Clarence Thomas was a Black Panther. Uh, Walter Williams was far more sympathetic to the views of, of Malcolm X than of Martin Luther King. Shelby Steele was a, a big radical leftist in the 1960s. So that, that is an interesting dynamic. But again, it's not uh, unusual. Uh, you know, Sowell was a product of the Jim Crow South. He was born in the Depression era. Uh, North Carolina in 1930, was orphaned as a child, never knew his mother or his father. 
uh, he was raised by a distant relative who brought him north to Harlem in New York City where he was raised. Had a rather tumultuous uh, home life, uh, never graduated from high school, left home at age 17 to strike out on his own. And he, he talks about having um, a job in, as, a, as a teenager after he dropped out of school as a messenger for Western Union. Uh, so this would have been in the 1940s. And the Western Union office was located in lower Manhattan, down in the Wall Street era, area. But he lived up in, in Harlem, so he had to travel the entire length of the island of Manhattan to get home. And he would sometimes ride a, a double-decker bus home at the time. And he would go up through the Wall Street district and past these fancy shopping districts on Fifth Avenue with Saks Fifth Avenue and the rest, go past Carnegie Hall, go up Riverside Drive in these very ritzy neighborhoods. And then he would cross this viaduct and he'd be in the ghetto where he would get off. And he would say, what, what just happened? Why did it look like that down there and it looks like this up here? And he said at the time, Marxism explained it. Marxism had an explanation for this that sounded plausible to him at the time. Uh, the, you know, the people down there were they exploiting the people up here. Uh, and it was a fight to the death. And, 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 and Tom, it made sense to him. And it was only later, uh, after he had uh, studied economics, uh, even after he had studied under Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago, uh, he remained a Marxist. But it was a job in the government, working for the Department of Labor. Uh, and, and focusing on minimum wage laws, where he began to change his mind. Uh, he learned that minimum wage laws were hurting employment, particularly among low-income minorities, and he realized that the government had its own agenda, and it, it, it didn't necessarily um, uh, you know, link uh, or join uh, at the hip with the, the needs and the wants of uh, the underclass, in particular minorities in particular. So he began to rethink his whole view of of the role of government and the benevolence of government and, and socialism in general and Marxism in general. Uh, so it was, a, it was a personal experience really that began to turn him away from his Marxism. Yeah, I, I was really surprised to, to read in the book that it, it wasn't Milton Friedman who convinced him otherwise, but he had this great experience at, uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, speak about his, his, his life in academia because it was, I, I sense that there was a lot of tension there. He was frustrated about his experience at Howard and then he went to Cornell and, and again, it was not the experience that he had expected. He was a tough grader. Uh, he expected a lot of his students. And, um, and that led him really, I think, away from teaching ultimately. Yes, uh, you're, you're right about that. I heard Senator Cruz mention earlier about the left's taking over of higher education uh, back in the 1960s. Well, Seoul was in higher education. Throughout the 60s, he taught at um, Rutgers University. He taught at, um, uh, at Cornell in the late 60s when they had the student protests there. And um, Seoul wanted to teach economics. It was his first love. And it was classroom teaching that he wanted to do. It wasn't even research. Uh, you have to also appreciate how late a start Tom got. Uh, he didn't get an undergraduate degree until he was 28 years old. Um, he didn't write his first book until he was 40. And considering how prolific he's been, you, it just blows your mind how much more prolific uh, he might have been had he gotten the traditional start of, a, of an academic. But in the, um, in the 1960s, academia was changing. You had a civil rights movement, you had a women's rights movement, you had a gay rights movement, you had an anti-war movement. Um, and, and all of these movements used campuses as platforms for their ideologies. Uh, administrators were flustered by this, faculty were flustered. And uh, higher education was rethinking its role in society. And Tom wanted to teach the way he had been taught. And that was very difficult to do in the 1960s. And he was someone who was not going to turn over the classroom discussion to the newspaper headlines of the day. You could not be excused from class to go to a protest. Um, he, he was just a, a very straight shooter. He didn't grade on the curve. He didn't like people auditing his class and so forth. And so there were these constant run-ins with administrators, with faculty. And, and then I believe that the, the situation at Cornell in the late 60s with the, with the student protesters and the way the uh, administrators just let those guys walk all over them really, really was the last straw for Seoul. I think he was, he was really done with academia by then. He continued to teach throughout the 70s, but he kind of had one foot out the door and, and into the think tank world. Uh, throughout most of the 70s. He, he hung on, uh, got tenure at UCLA, and then joined the Hoover Institution 
in 1980, um, where he has uh, remained to this day. Uh, you mentioned Milton Friedman earlier and the influence of Milton Friedman, and you're right, it wasn't on, on, on moving him away from Marxism, but Friedman was a mentor, along with George Stigler, another Nobel uh, Prize winning economist, and I think what Tom mostly got um, from them, uh, not only in terms of his, his own teaching style, they were also known as very tough yeah. teachers um, and graders, but particularly from Friedman, he got a, a notion of what a public intellectual should be about, what public intellectualism is about, what scholarship is about. And Friedman, upon leaving teaching in the 70s, after he'd won his Nobel Prize, went on to write a lot of books in plain spoken English. He uh, gave a lot of lectures to people who were non-economists. He thought the role of a scholar was to be able to explain your discipline to non-scholars. Tom really took that to heart. Most of his books are not written for his peers. That is by design. They are written in plain spoken prose. His best-selling book is Basic Economics, which is basically an economics textbook with no graphs and charts in it. Um, and, and been translated into seven or eight languages. And so that is what he got from Friedman. I think the model public intellectualism, uh, the scholar, the true scholar should not only be talking to his peers in the academy, but should take the time to explain his discipline to others. And so even though Sol left teaching uh, back in the 70s, he continued to teach through his books, through his columns and so forth. When he retired the column uh, back in um, uh, 2016, I believe I wrote that uh, some people just lost the best professor they, they ever had, even if they never went, went to college. Well, and you, and you write in the book how, in, in many ways, it may have been a blessing that, uh, that he had this experience in academia, so so many millions more were able to really appreciate True. and learn from him. True, but in some ways, it's uh, in the research for the book, some people say the trade-off, there, there was a trade-off there. Okay. Uh, and the trade-off was that uh, we don't have uh, thousands of, 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 of people out there who were Thomas Sowell students and graduate students and studied under him for their PhDs and so forth. There isn't another army of Thomas Sowells coming along in the next generation or two. And you contrast that with the other side. Uh, when, when the Henry Louis Gateses and the Cornell Wests are gone, they are going to be replaced like that. There will be 10 people lined up to continue saying what they are saying. And so some people say they wish Tom had stuck it out in academia, and maybe we would have uh, uh, this cadre of, of, of younger intellectuals coming along. So there is, there, there, there is a trade-off. I don't think I would trade anything for the books, but um, th there is an argument to be made uh, on, on that front. You mentioned earlier the value that uh, Tom Sowell places on facts and evidence. Um, explains his move away from Marxism and, and also uh, how he became a free market advocate. But we are living in a society today where it seems that that's not, there isn't that value. And we struggle, those of us who work for policy organizations and, and think tanks today, to persuade others uh, based on facts and data and evidence. What advice or what challenge do you want to present to our audience today in the spirit of Tom Sowell on that front? Oh, you've got to <laughs> keep up the fight. I was, I was just talking to, to, to Lindsay, uh, and I was uh, talking about our conversations back in the 90s when I was on the editorial board of the journal in uh, the 2000s, and we would discuss education policy, and the framework in which we were discussing education reform today versus what the education discussion has become today, which is about keeping things like the 1619 Project nonsense outside of the classroom. I mean, when we were having our conversations, that stuff had, was relegated to the academy. You know, they were, they were in seminars and nobody took it seriously. And now it's being taught to seven and eight-year-olds and, and, and they're lies. Uh, I mean, and uh, Tom has written about this stuff uh, in, in depth, that trying to, to place slavery at the center of U.S. history slavery is about the least remarkable thing about American history. Slave, slavery existed for thousands of years down through history before America ever came into being in every society all over the planet. What makes America unique is not its slave past, it's emancipation that makes America unique. <laughs> I mean, and, and you know, this idea that you would try and place this at the center 
of, 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 of US history and, and paint America somehow uniquely evil for this and then teach it to our children is uh, a, a fight I never thought we'd be in the middle of. But here we are, and I think it's a very, very important one. Well, you, you say that uh, Sol, in many ways, was ahead of his time writing about some of these issues uh, when it comes to, to, to race and equal rights. He advocated for black self-improvement uh, as opposed to government handouts. Uh, this was happening, in, in some cases, 60 years ago. So what was it about him? What did he identify at that time? And what motivated him to delve into these issues, perhaps maybe reluctantly at first, uh, but become such a well-known scholar? Well, Back in, the, again, you have to keep in mind uh, uh, Tom's age, but back in the, um, in the 1960s, you know, he was already in his 30s, and he saw the, the civil rights movement, which he supported at the time, and this is pre-64 Civil Rights Bill, starting to diverge in directions where he saw trouble ahead. Uh, one was a move away um, from equal uh, opportunity to equal outcomes, and he said this is not the route to go, special treatment for black racial preferences, this will not end well. Um, the other thing he, he predicted was that um, the new emphasis, particularly after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the new emphasis of the civil rights leadership on integrating political institutions, um, he said was, was barking up the wrong tree. That um, uh, the, the thinking on the left at the time was if we can just elect more black officials, the rest of these inequalities will take care of themselves. And so that became the, the, the focus. And Tom had looked at what other groups had done and to rise from, prosperity, from poverty to prosperity, other ethnic and racial minorities, and concluded that that was not the most efficient path uh, you could take, and that the most successful groups had not gone for political power first. They had gone for economic development, educational achievement, and so forth. And that is what blacks had been doing in the pre-60s era and there had been tremendous progress and a narrowing of gaps in that era. And all of that started to reverse or slow uh, or you know, in, in, in wake of the, 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 the shifting emphasis of the civil rights movement. But Sowell had, um, had predicted this, this outcome a long, a long, long time ago. Uh, he was also ahead of the curve on, on um, affirmative action and its impact on uh, narrowing gaps in racial achievement. Uh, he said that if you take uh, kids that are not qualified and, and put them in schools, you're setting them up to fail. Um, and, and that is exactly what, what has happened. We all know that after the University of California system uh, ended affirmative action back in the 1990s and race ended its race-based ad admissions, uh, black graduation rates went up, Hispanic graduation rates went up, and not by a little bit, by more than 50%. And in the more difficult disciplines of math, and science and engineering, again, by more than 50%. So a, a, a program that had put, been put in place to help increase the ranks of the black middle class, uh, the increase the ranks of black professionals, had in practice uh, left us with fewer black doctors and lawyers and engineers and architects than we would have had in the absence of the policy. Tom called this out in the, in, in the early 1970s. Jason, one of the things that I find so encouraging about Sol and his work is the embrace uh, among young people. Uh, you write about the anonymous uh, Twitter account uh, in his name and how popular it has become, uh, just not run by Sol himself, but by, by an individual um, who's anonymous, who posts quotes and videos. Uh, his YouTube videos, uh, videos like Peter Robinson's Uncommon Knowledge and those interviews that are, are so popular today. What is it about his message that, that young people find so appealing? I, I think it's his, well, two things. He, he's, he's very straightforward um, uh, in his writing, clear, and he's also extremely accessible, which I think young people, older people appreciate that too, but young people appreciate his accessibility. He is a, a very learned person, but he wears it lightly in, in his writings. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and that comes across very clearly in his work. And I think that is something that, um, that appeals, appeals a great deal to, to, to young people today. He, he's just someone willing uh, to, to say what needs to be said and, 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 and has done so for a long time. He says and writes what a lot of people are thinking and what too many of his peers in the academy shy away from saying because they have different priorities. And I think people appreciate that straightforwardness, that honestness that he, that he brings to, um, to whatever he's discussing. 
What, uh, as, you, as you worked on this biography, what, um, what book or, or what issue do you feel he had the greatest impact on? Shifting public debate or changing people's minds? Well, I, I think his, his, his work on, on affirmative action has called into question a, a lot of the, uh, the prevailing rhetoric surrounding it coming out of the left. Is it just a purely a, a, a social good? Um, he, he really has, uh, through his studies of affirmative action, not only here in the U.S., but um, uh, around the world, uh, has shown that these policies, as he said in the video, policies that have been put in place to help blacks in the U.S., not only have failed blacks in the U.S., they've failed every group they've been put in place to help all, all, all over the world. And he's also talked about the importance of developing human capital, um, the right skills and attitudes and habits and behaviors that are conducive to upward mobility, and how if a group develops those, it doesn't really matter who gets elected. Um, it doesn't really matter how the greater society around you uh, uh, treats you, um, because all of that is, is, is in your head. It's between your ears, and that's something that, that can't be taken away from you. And he cited example after example around the world, the, the way the, the ethnic Chinese are treated in Southeast Asia, the way Jews are treated uh, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, um, the way Asian, Japanese uh, Americans are treated in this country. Um, uh, yet today, outperform both academically and economically the very groups that treated them that way because they developed that human capital. And again, he, he, he talks about uh, what was going on in black America when the development of that human capital was the focus and what has happened since it has become less of a focus. And, and I think uh, he's made his mark there. Yeah, no, that's, that is for sure. You, uh, so, so much of this morning's conversation uh, earlier today was about winning the war on woke. And in some ways, uh, Tom Slow was again ahead of his time. He just referred to it in a different term, social justice. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he did, but it's, it's interesting. And part of winning this war is, 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 is winning the, uh, almost the, the semantic debate, the, the words, the phrases. I mean, I, we can't even talk about uh, self-improvement or self-betterment anymore. It's, it's as if uh, those, those phrases are verboten. We talk about privilege and advantage and disadvantage, almost in a passive sense, as if people have no real agency, that oh, society determines through structural this and that, determines outcomes, and people uh, can't make decisions for themselves. And, and, and you, you you really have to take back this language. You can't concede uh, th th this terminology, you know, uh, anti-racism or, or um, uh, you know, systemic bias and, and, and things like that. Um, I, I hope we don't try and, and fight back using those terms um, uh, because I think uh, you'll be fighting at a, at a, at a disadvantage uh, if you do play in that, in, in that briar patch. You know? yeah. Uh, you mentioned his mentors um, at, at the Chicago School and, and how you know, they were honored with the Nobel Prize. And, and Seoul, in many ways, was reviled by left-wing academics. Um, how has that impacted him personally and, and maybe you know, not afforded him those same honors and sure. prestige that, uh, that others received? Well, he, he, was, he was, today we'd call it being canceled, but Tom was canceled a long time ago. The media, my profession, continues to, to, to go to the black left um, elites to speak on behalf of all blacks. One thing Tom often points out, because he's often asked in, uh, by interviewers, you know, how does it feel to go against the grain of so many other blacks? And he says, uh, wait a minute, I don't go against the grain of so many other blacks. You mean against the grain of other black elites? Black elites are no more representative of black people than white elites are of white people. And he usually rejects the premise of the country, uh, uh, the question that way. And he's still true on that. And you can see this in everything from back then, you could see it in the busing wars where the NAACP supported busing, most blacks did not. Today you see it with school choice, most blacks supporting that, black elites. Voter ID laws are supported by most blacks, but not black elites. Um, uh, you know, affirmative action in higher education, racial preferences in colleges are supported by black elites, but not by most black people, in poll after poll after poll. So that, that, that disconnect uh, remains, and, and, and Sol has, has spent a lifetime pointing, pointing that out. But it's cost him, I think, in terms of prestige, 
um, uh, the, the, the types of people who hand out Nobel Prizes and academic awards, these are controlled by the academy and, and the media and, and, the, and, and, the, and, the, and the awards committees and so forth are all part of the left. And, and Tom's refusal to play footsie with these folks over the years, I think, has cost him uh, professionally. And it's part of the reason some of those other folks I mentioned are, are, are better known uh, than he is, uh, despite uh, them not being able to, to, to measure up uh, academically uh, in, or in terms of his scholarship and his output. Um, personally, I, I, I don't think it bothers Tom. He's interested in getting his ideas out there, and, and, and he wanted me to focus on his ideas in this book. He's written a memoir, if you want a deep dive into his personal life, but this is primarily a book about his ideas. And it is a fantastic book. Um, it's, uh, it's truly well written, Jason. Thank you so much for doing it. One final question for you. What, have you, what lesson would you say you've personally learned and, and has been more, most heartfelt for you from Tom Sowell? Uh, to, to, to stay the course, uh, mainly. I mean, when, 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 when Tom was coming up, he, he, I think of the life he had when he was born, uh, being a black person in, in, in America at that time, where he was born, where he came from, what he has been able to accomplish. I find it very inspirational. And, 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 and basically, I tell myself, you have no excuses, Jason. <laughs> no excuses for you. And, and then I tell my kids they have no excuses yeah. either. Uh, if I have no excuses, so uh, so that is that is less. Just his, by by ex the the example he has set. Um, uh, he he says that. He started writing, Tom would, would be a significant intellectual figure if he had never written a single word about race or ethnicity. His work on economic history mm -hmm. has distinguished him among his peers, his publications and peer-reviewed journals and books on those topics. That alone, knowledge and decisions, a conflict of visions, his legacy would rest on works like that. Um, Tom says he turned to writing on race out of a sense of duty because there were things that needed to be said and too few other academics and scholars who are willing to say them. I find that tremendously admirable, and I think he has, he has done his duty. Absolutely. Again, the book is called Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell. Um, Jason will be uh, outside in the foyer at 2.30 to sign copies. We are so grateful for you telling his story and making sure that the next generation and generations afterward uh, understand the, the important role that he's played in, in our country and, um, and everything he's contributed.